short delay. Um, and uh, happy to be here on a dark November morning for province-wide rounds. As many of you know, I want you to type your questions into the Q&A box in the bottom of the toolbar. You can also raise your hand. And for troubleshooting or any technical problems, please contact Sidoni. And her email address is there. Next slide. So we're hosting this session on the unceded and ancestral territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territory of the Musqueam, Squ Squamish, tsleil Nations, and the Métis Chartered Community, the Lower Mainland Region. I personally am in Mount Pleasant, which is at the mouth of the Fraser River, where there used to be a, a salmon exchange. Next slide. So it really gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. James Land. James is an assistant professor in the University of British Columbia. Importantly, he's actually co-appointed at the Departments of Pathology and Lab Medicine, as well as Medicine in the Division of Nephrology. He's the director, newly appointed, of the Immunology member of the Kidney Transplant Program at Vancouver General and uh, a Provincial Service. He obtained his medical, medical degree, internal medicine and nephrology training at UBC. And in 2013, he cross-trained in histocompatibility and immunogenetics under Dr. Elaine Reed at UCLA. He brings uh, to Vancouver and to the province an amazing uh, in-depth understanding and skill with respect to immunogenetics and the application of biomarkers in the context of rejection and clinical transition of next generation sequencing technologies. And it's really fantastic to have him as part of our uh, division and community. So James, over to you to tell us about checkpoint inhibitors in kidney transplantation, do or die. Thank you very much, Adira. I'm just gonna bring up my presentation here. So I think um, uh, Mac Dad came up with this title for me. Uh, it's a very catchy one, but I do hope that in the future, the patients don't have to choose between do or die. Um, so um, I have renamed the title as Considerations of Checkpoint Inhibitor Therapy in Kidney Transplant Patients. Um, I have a few disclosures. Um, uh, first is I'm not an oncologist. Um, I uh, have not been an expert in uh, on oncologic medicine or any of the uh, therapeutics until presently, just because of my training in immunology, I've been forced to um, deal with this situation because the new tools that have come online, they really, um, they, they really quite emphasize the uh, understanding of our immunology and how to apply it in, in uh, medicine. Um, I also have a disclosure to make um, about Natera Inc., uh, which is supporting one of the studies will be launching very soon. I'll describe that at the end. So I want to start with the case presentation because this was really the index case where we came together to follow a patient, a kidney transplant patient in BC who went on checkpoint inhibitor. Um, and um, that was quite rare in the past. Um, in talking to my general nephrology colleagues, it looks like uh, many of you are starting to get patients referred to you for uh, renal issues due to checkpoint. Um, so this is specifically about kidney transplant patients. However, I think the concepts would apply to general nephrology as well. This is a 69-year-old uh, patient with ESRD from polycystic kidney disease. Um, he received a living donor transplant in 2013. Um, had very good kidney function, really had no uh, remarkable complications post-kidney transplant. Um, when he was referred to um, see me, um, his creatinine was quite good. His baseline creatinine was about 100, very minimal proteinuria. And his baseline immunosuppression consisted of macrophenolate 500 milligrams twice a day, tacrolimus and prednisone. So very much like your typical patient uh, in a community. Um, unfortunately for him, his main problem has been malignancy. In June 2019, he first developed a preauricular um, squamous cell that involved the uh, uh, lymph nodes uh, around the uh, parotid gland. At that time, he underwent curative radiation treatment, and then it seems like that took care of the problem, and he continued on with his life uh, without much problems. But then in May uh, 2020, so only a couple months ago, he started having chest pain and the CT revealed multiple masses in the right lung, and he also had a right um, a pluriffusion that was associated with the mass. His biopsy showed a poorly differentiated SCC and most likely metastatic, which makes sense given the primary that occurred one year ago. Uh, his bone scan also showed uptake in multiple ribs, 
And so he, he really is in bad, bad shape uh, when, when he was referred to see me because already um, the cancer was quite metastatic. So at this point in time, uh, we had a few things to talk about. Uh, one was, well, what are the goals of treatment for this patient? How should we manage the immunosuppressant for this patient, given this is someone who had very good kidney function and enjoy really all the benefits of kidney transplant, but now has this terrible metastatic uh, cancer? How should we follow the cancer treatment? How should we organize the care for this patient? Because by then we had a um, general nephrologist involved, his primary nephrologist is um, Dr. Michaud and, and her team. Um, he has an oncologist, and now it's been referred to me as a, a third person, a kidney transplant uh, person. So there were quite a few things to talk about. And the first question that came my way and really the reason why he was referred to see me was the oncologist would like to treat with checkpoint inhibitor. And he had never done it in a kidney transplant patient before. Um, and I'll go into more about this. Um, primarily because of the literature in a very high risk of rejection in kidney for any uh, solid organ transplant patients. Someone seems to be uh, not muted and causing some background. If you can mute yourself, that would be much appreciated. Um, so, so really that, that was the, the whole point is, can we use a checkpoint inhibitor treatment in this patient? I wanna just back up a little bit here about cancer in, in transplant patients. Um, I'm giving a shout out here to our uh, friend and colleague, uh, Chris Blosser at UW, who just had his publication in KI. And really what he was inter in, interested in is to understand what's the incidence of cancer and outcomes in kidney transplant patients in the US over a very prolonged time, uh, over um, three decades, essentially. And what he found was that despite, you know, we hear about improvements in cancer treatment, in uh, screening, that really the cancer incidence over time in our kidney transplant patients really hasn't changed uh, for almost all the cancers, except with the, perhaps a decrease in prostate. And when you look at what happens to these patients' outcomes, really um, with the exception of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, where uh, we know a little bit better and there's been groundbreaking uh, treatment with rituximab almost a decade ago that led to better um, death sensor um, on graft loss and also death wave function in graft, everything else has really been no change. And that's the problem that we struggle with today. You know, we see these patients who live longer today, who are getting older, they have a higher burden of immune suppression on board, and then eventually many of them do get cancer. And there has been no groundbreaking treatment that has really moved the needle in terms of their uh, overall survival. And so result, what we see here and what um, Dr. Blosser shows here is that um, the majority of these patients, they die with a um, functioning graft, you know, um, and sometimes we venture to stop their immune suppression to try to give them perhaps better um, uh, uh, anti-tumor uh, activity, uh, and then that invariably sometimes lead to um, graft loss. So that's where we stand today, is that either they die with a functioning graft, uh, from the effect of overimmune suppression and cancer development, or sometimes we try to reduce their immune suppression, and then some of them unfortunately do go on to get rejection and eventually lose their graft. So it's never an easy thing when we um, are referred to see these patients. There's a lot of anxiety, depends on which um, transplant nephrologist sees them. The treatments may be different as well. But I think uh, going forward, um, that will probably, that landscape will change because of this new class of medication called checkpoint inhibitors. And this is a, another publication in KI, again, very recent because um, this class of meds is quite new. And um, as many of you already know, that this class of medications are notorious for causing many uh, multi-system, really autoimmune disease. You know, starting with your eye, you can get a lot of inflammation, conjunctivitis, uveitis, and myocarditis. Um, when I was doing CTU before, I've seen patients with um, diabetes uh, really caused by autoimmune disease of the pancreas, and again, so on and so forth. In the kidney, um, you might have already seen patients with um, interstitial nephritis caused by this or other um, entities of GN um, due to the checkpoint inhibition. So what are um, um, checkpoint inhibitors? Um, if you're like me, I have a hard time remembering um, all these medications because there seems to be more uh, each month 
uh, but they really fall into a few different classes, and which I put over here for you. They can either be the CTOA4, the PD1, or the PD1 ligand type. Okay. Um, and I'll go into the mechanism uh, with the next slide. Uh, what I want to show here um, also for you is the, the half life of these medications. Uh, these are in days. And they could be quite long. For many of them, they're about three weeks. And the clinical relevance here is that between the time when you stop checkpoint inhibitor or you're, if you're given medications to try to counteract the autoimmune phenomenon of checkpoint inhibitor, sometimes that can take quite a while before one starts to see effect just because the medication uh, is in circulation for, for quite a bit. All right, um, this is an important slide. I will just uh, spend a few uh, minutes on, on this one because I think it will make clear to you um, how these medications work and why we see the problems that we, we see. Um, I'm going to use the, um, the model of a um, kidney rejection. So kidney rejection, as you know, um, are primarily caused by T cells. T cells, they get activated and they go out and destroy the allograft. And the way they, T cells become activated is that the antigen presenting cells, they present foreign molecules. So in this case would be the donor antigen to the uh, T cells. The T cells become activated and then they go out and destroy um, the allograft tissue. The reason that immune suppression can lead to a higher risk of cancer is because the T cells in addition to fighting uh, infection and causing allograft rejection, one of their primary functions is to go out there and kill and survey and kill tumor cells as well. So the tumor cells, so many of them have MHC as well. They can present um, these antigens and then become activated T cells. And in turn, the T cells can go out there and, and um, eliminate tumor cells. Immune suppression really don't regulate the T cell function. And as a consequence, many tumor cells, they can escape the surveillance of the T cells. The, 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 uh, nature is very smart. Um, if you have unregulated T cells, they can go out and cause autoimmune disease. And to prevent that from happening, the T cells, they're under inhibitory signals from PD-1 and also CTLA-4. So as soon as the T cells become activated, there's a counter-regulatory mechanism with expression of PD-1. And that allows the T cells to have a way to become quiescent again. Same with CTLA-4. And that's how tumors really in, uh, evade um, the T cell response, is that they can express the TV, uh, PD-1 ligand, which sends an inhibitory signal to T cell to really shut down the T cells. Or they can really hijack the CTOA4 and really send another inhibitory signal to the T cells um, to really downregulate the T cell response. So the scientists are very clever again. So they try to hijack the system again by really uh, making monoclonal antibodies directed against the PD-1 ligand, that's one class, or directed against the PD-1, essentially to take away this inhibitory signal. The other arm is the CTOA4, where you can make an, another um, monoclonal antibody to it. So you stop that inhibitory signal. This will reactivate the T cells to go out there to destroy the tumor cells. But in the process, the problem is also, this is a non-selected process, is that you can have the off-target effect. It can cause autoimmune disease. If these T cells happen to destroy um, your cell tissue, or it can go out there and cause, of course, rejection of the allograft. And this is a fun pro fundamental problem that we have. Um, it's very um, uh, reminiscent of GVHD um, for bone marrow transplant patients where on one hand, you really want the T cells to become as activated as they can be so they can have a good anti-tumor response. On the other hand, if that um, overactivation T cells is uh, not regulated, that can destroy the kidney allograft. Um, because of that, there has been a fear to use this class of medications um, in cellular organ transplant patients. And uh, there has been a number of reports published uh, mostly case series, and um, the data has really not been very uh, useful. This publication came out um, just in this uh, Munster AJT, 
and it, it's a systematic review. And I do think that it moves the needle a little bit because it sets the stage for our understanding by taking all these um, case series and I uh, examine in such a way to give us useful information. And I will just show some data from this publication because I think it's quite relevant for the discussion today. The first thing to know here is that the allograft rejection occurred in about 40% of patients. And amongst those with rejection, end-stage organ failure occurred in 70% of cases. And I'll just go into that here. Um, the first thing when we talk to you again, my patient or um, any patient who goes on checkpoint inhibitor, the question is going to be what's the downside? And the, the worst one is, you know, allograft rejection and graft failure. And they're going to want to know, well, where do we stand with this? So now we have some basis to tell them that about 40% of the time, one can get a rejection. And this is a survival in terms of um, graft rejection. You can see the trajectory here. It tends to happen very quickly right after starting CPI, that really the median time to uh, rejection is only about five to six weeks. And after that, it kind of plateaus off. That I will discuss a bit later because that will have implication on how we monitor these patients. The second question that transplant um, nephrologists are interested in is, well, what ought to be their immune suppression when they start checkpoint inhibitor? Intuitively, you would think if we withdraw all immunosuppression, these patients will have a very high risk of rejection. And that's probably true. On the other hand, if we don't adjust immune suppression and we keep everything the same it is, then we worry that the CPIs may not be very efficacious. The whole point is that we lower immune suppression, the CPI can activate the T cells. But if we continue to suppress the T cell with our own medications, then what is the point of CPI? And that's really the biggest dilemma that we have. So what they're trying to show um, in this graph here is that um, if uh, one doesn't, if one withdraws most immunosuppression so that they have no immune suppression on board or they only take steroids, then their risk of rejection as we expected would be quite exuberant. So uh, most of them will reject. If they, the patients are kept with one drug in addition to corticosteroids, that uh, risk of rejection seems to be much mitigated. So already we have a starting point to talk to our patients that if we want to preserve allograft, and again, this is very um, a personal decision we'll have to communicate with the patient, that then we probably don't want to go with which of all immune suppression or to be on steroids alone. We probably want to keep one. Um, the question is which one should we keep? And, and that's a loaded question that this paper cannot answer yet because the data is just too small. The other questions that we have is, um, what are the risk factors for rejection on CPI? And also, are there protective factors against rejection? And we already covered this, at least one drug other than corticosteroids would protect someone from getting rejection. This is not surprising. If someone already had a demonstrated rejection previously, you're gonna have a higher risk when they go on CPI. Time to transplant, this is an interesting one. So the further ones away from the time of transplant before starting CPI, they have a lower risk of rejection. And this is likely because of graft tolerance. Like if you have kept the graft for 20 years, probably your body is more tolerant of the graft than someone who is only three years after transplant, for instance, and needs to go on CPI. Um, this, what about calcineurin inhibitors? Um, seems to be a little bit protective against rejection but you know, again, it really crosses the, the reference point. So really cannot say that um, this may be related to numbers. So they couldn't really say anything robust about the use of calcium inhibitors. Using CTOA for the reference, uh, PD-1 uh, class or in combination with CTOA-4 seem to confer a higher risk of rejection. And this is an interesting one because this is not the first publication to have shown this. Um, when you talk to the oncologist, they will say that PD-1 class medication compared to CTOA-4, they have a decreased risk of causing autoimmune side effects. However, there has been multiple publications that show with PD-1 inhibition in terms of rejection, the risk is actually higher compared to CTOA-4. And certainly there is a number of patients 
where oncologists have started to use combination CTOA4 and PD-1, and the signal for rejection also is higher as well. So the next question is, well, if we decide to keep some immunosuppression on board for our transplant patient, what is the efficacy on anti-tumor response in terms of CPI medications? And what the investigators are trying to show here is that maybe there's a decreased efficaciousness of CPI if you keep patients on immune suppression uh, more than steroid alone. So again, this um, curve here uh, falls lower than the uh, no drugs or steroid alone curve. It's not statistically significant, but there is definitely a trend. But then they also go on to say, despite that trend, the overall um, tumor-free survival, progression-free survival in this entire cohort was very similar to um, general population non-immunosuppression. About 30 of 30 percent of the patients, their um, tumor progression halted or regressed on CPI. Okay, so that was a lot of data to go through. I just wanted to give a summary here so far. Um, so CPI in transplant patients cause a high risk of rejection. Now we can tell patients about 40% of the time you would get a rejection. And if you do get a rejection, the odds are in the favor that um, the, the organ will fail. The rejection tends to um, occur early. The median time to reject, rejection was five weeks, which means that we do want to follow patients a lot more closely, probably in the first two or three months. There are some protective factors for rejection, time since transplant, and what we decide to do with the immune suppression regimen for our patients. Um, it's very tempting to say, well, if someone um, has immune um, adverse events, maybe they have a higher risk for rejection, and that was not the case. There was no association between the two. It's also um, very tempting to say, if someone has rejection, that means the T cells are very activated, maybe they'll get a better anti-tumor response, and that was not the case as well. Importantly for kidney transplant patients, the patient's survival did not differ between those with or without rejection. And this is very important when I say kidney transplant patients because um, the data is different for heart, liver, or lung transplant because when they fail the organ, they most likely will die. So the threshold risk for them to get rejection will be different from ours because we can always rely on going back on dialysis if that's what the patient uh, decides is acceptable. And as I already said, um, despite the use in this cohort, most patients had at least one immune suppression on board. They continue to get stabilization and regression of tumor, tumor with CPI. So if one gets CPI, how many of them will make it to the end? Um, alive, free from rejection, and tumor progression. This is really the best outcome that one can hope for. And this number is actually higher than I expected. It's 20% of them could end up in that scenario. So again, this um, publication doesn't answer all the questions that we have, but I think it provides a starting point so we can have an honest discussion with our patients. And then there's re remaining questions. How can we better risk stratify our patients? What about the use of NTOR inhibitor? Is this a potential agent that can reduce rejection without compromising anti-tumor activity? I'll go into more about this in a little bit. And how can we better follow our patients? So I just want to come back to our patients because all these questions we have to talk to our patient. The first thing was to clarify the goals of care. And in the past, there's been only a couple cases of um, transplant patients, at least at VGH, where um, their oncologist wanted to do uh, wanted to uh, use uh, CPI. And uh, some of them outright declined because at that point in their lives, some patients, they said, uh, going back on dialysis is not within uh, what they want for their um, goals of care. So really they would rather die with a cancer than to go back on dialysis again. And if that's what they want, then the calculation of what we do for these patients is very different. In this particular patient, um, he, he was very clear that he wanted to live longer, that he would um, try to get the best treatment for cancer. And if he goes back on dialysis, then he feels that so be it. So the first thing to know is that then he's uh, threshold risk for um, rejection is already different from the other patients that we've encountered before. What about immunosuppression adjustment? Really, this is what we were being consulted to do. So at the time of his metastatic squamous cell, his microphenolate was 
already stopped. And that's consistent with most practice that we stop at least one of the anti-rejection medication, um, especially if it's a squamous cell phenotype. And then um, I, I debated about this decision, but eventually what I did is I took him off tacrolimus and put it on serolimus. And this is primarily based on the um, data that serolimus uh, works fairly, uh, has the best evidence in counteracting squamous cell um, tumors. And this is someone who had repeated skin cancer, now has metastatic uh, squamous cell. I feel that the use of serolimus, if he can tolerate it, would be um, a probably a good agent for, for this particular patient. And the patient remained on prednisone. One of the other reasons for using serolimus was that there is some in, um, in vitro evidence serolimus used together with CPI will synergize the anti-tumor effect of CPI. Um, there is no data yet to demonstrate that effect in um, clinical studies yet. Uh, some are coming because I have reviewed some uh, manuscripts already, um, but I do think that there's at least a rationale for the, using the two together. And I, I, I think out of the concerns of the patient and the nephrologist, oncologist, and also myself, because it's really the index case that we have had to deal with this patient in our province, we decided to do an interdisciplinary follow-up clinic uh, once a week. And that, that was really um, outstanding. I think um, I, I have to thank Dr. Michaud and, and her team for um, really um, arranging this with us. Uh, I remember every Friday morning, we would have a Zoom call uh, with a patient, with uh, Dr. Michaud and her team, myself, and then the oncologist was also uh, kept up to date on a weekly basis as well, really to, to see what would happen to the patient and how does the patient do once we uh, um, start the CPI. And um, the patient did very well with the um, conversion from tacrolimus to serolimus. As you know, that's not always the case. Um, we, we were checking for possible serolimus induced side effects every week, and the patient did not encounter any. So we were happy with that. And that process continued for over two months. You know, we're meeting weekly, um, and then time passed by. I remember we started this case in the summer, and then now we're in the fall. And I was really happy to see that his graph function remained very well. Clinically, he felt excellent on the CPI. He felt that, he, he, he claimed that he didn't know if that was a placebo effect or true anti-tumor response, but he felt much better than before. And we're very delighted to see that. And then really at a two month mark, you know, we kind of all collectively feel that perhaps now is the time to dial back on our frequency of follow-up. We went to every two weeks, I um, gave the care transfer the care back to Dr. Michelle and her team, and then to sit back and really to be consulted on a PRN basis. And then of course, um, came October, the creatinine initially innocently rose a little bit, and then really very quickly went up to over 400. And by then, uh, personally, I was a little disappointed because this patient is just a lovely person. I wanted to see him do well, and he did very well for over two months. Really, I, I thought he had made it out of the the at-risk period, but it was clear that you know he, he was rejecting. So we did biopsy the patient, brought him in the hospital really under Dr. Michel, and um, he had a T-cell rejection with a vascular component as well, and the kidney was quite damaged. So this was not really a very mild rejection at all. It was a pretty robust um, T-cell re uh, rejection that we were seeing. So at that point in time, we had a decision to make. The usual treatment, if we see this outside of CPI, we would give ATG and completely deplete the T cells. Obviously, we wouldn't do that in this case because the patient made it very clear. Their goals of care is to um, have anti-tumor effect. We rely on the T cells for anti-tumor effect. So we could not go ahead and deplete T cells. So we gave him a really big challenge of a methylprednisolone pulse and then followed by a very slow taper. And this is really uh, going back to um, what I said before, that the CPIs stay in your uh, circulation for about three weeks, that's the half-life. So um, if you talk to the oncologist, when they give steroids, they taper very slowly. We probably do wanna taper a bit faster than the usual oncology patients because he's also maintained on another immune suppression. So they probably wouldn't tolerate um, the same degree of slow taper of prednisone, but we're, really making up our schedule this time. So we um, did a pulse followed by a slow taper and then his creatinine really 
um, had a good response coming down. So how can we improve uh, patient risk stratification? Because obviously when we do this kind of follow-up, it's important to know, well, how long should we do the weekly follow-up for these patients? How carefully should we screen these patients? And as we all know, um, creatinine is not a very sensitive marker of injury. By the time the creatinine started to rise, probably he was already rejecting for quite a while. And we do also want to be able to detect rejection early on. So as many of you know, um, we have been working on a precision medicine approach to immune monitoring in uh, kidney uh, transplant patients, just in terms of rejection. And this is really on a basis that we understand today that it's really only a few amino acids on the surface of the HOA molecules that induce the immune response. And these are what we call epitopes or applets. Applets are really the determining amino acids within the center of an epitope. Um, and I'll give you an example over here. Um, and I've shown this before. If we have a patient recipient and they have three different donors and the present way we look at um, antigen matching, we would say these three donors, each one of them has one antigen mismatch because that's B8 versus B7. And really it doesn't give you a whole, whole lot of information. So it's not very granular. But if we look at the amino acid sequence uh, that can induce immune response, you can already see that this donor number one is actually the best donor for this patient in, in terms of how closely related their HOA molecules are. And that is really the crux of um, applet or epitope analysis. I've been told that I need to make immunology very simple for people to understand it. So for the dog lovers, I have a slide over here. The current way we look at antigen matching is very uh, imprecise. We're asking the question, are two HOA molecules the same? So if we use that approach and I ask you, are these two dogs the same? Are these two dogs the same? The answer is no, and the answer is no. That doesn't give us a lot of useful information. But when we go to applet matching, we now have the technology to tell us how similar or dissimilar are the two HOA molecules. So this way you can see, oh yeah, these two dogs, they're much more similar than this pair over here. And really that's analogous to what we're trying to do with the HOA molecules. And there's been a number of publications, this one is out of Winnipeg, that when you apply the epitope or applet mismatch analysis, that is much more flexible, that there's been thresholds defined where even if you're mismatched to eight molecules for DQ under uh, applets, that their graft survival um, rejection risk is much lower than someone who has more burden of mismatches. And that's for T cell rejection. So, um, and uh, there's been more work done to show that of all the HOA loci, it's the DQ locus, which is the most informative. So we can see every year we're making progress that every year there's more understanding about, well, which is the locus that matters the most? What's the threshold that ought to be if one wants to prevent rejection? And we're at a point where probably by next year, we'll be able to apply this stuff clinically to start to inform clinical practice. And the main barrier to implementing this clinically, as I've said this before, is that one needs to isolate DNA, get what we call high resolution HOA typing, four digit, put it into the software, and then that takes the linear sequence of the um, HOA molecule and fold it into a 3D structure to allow us to compare the 3D molecular differences. And the way to get this high resolution typing is very difficult to do. It requires um, a lot of sequencing. Not a lot of centers um, can do this. And in fact, we're the only center in Canada, we're the first center in Canada to be able to produce high resolution typing clinically on almost everybody. And that is the case for SOT patients these days. And the sequencer takes a long time to produce a result about one week. And to tailor this um, for more for clinical use in a timely fashion, we're developing a median approach, which is only a sequencing time of six hours. And again, this uh, technology is evolving rapidly. By next year, we are beginning to be able to use that um, uh, in, a, in a clinical way as well. So coming back to our patient, um, we apply after the fact um, the applet mismatch analysis. And what we found was that his threshold for DQ, again, the locus that matters the most in terms of predicting rejection, 
was actually quite high in terms of mismatch. And therefore, maybe in hindsight, it wasn't all that surprising that he rejected with this use of CPI. And in fact, going forward, I plan to um, contact many of the centers that have CPI patients to see if they will be able to share DNA with us so we can type them and analyze their epilim mismatch to inform that this correlate with patients that got rejection versus those ones that did not get rejection. The next question is, well, can we monitor patients better? And I only have one slide to show. Um, uh, if you haven't uh, been following uh, this uh, technology, this is called a donor-derived cell-free DNA. And um, this is why my wife from a couple of years ago uh, when I was doing my fellowship. And basically I learned about this technology in about 2012, 2013 um, from uh, prenatal taste, uh, testing. If you've had a baby uh, many years ago, then you wouldn't know much about this, but um, all the young people like myself in the audience, you, you will know this because if you have someone who just underwent prenatal testing, this is a technology that they use. So in prenatal testing, we're trying to understand, um, obviously what in my, uh, for myself, uh, during that time, I wanted to know the sex of the, the baby right away. I just couldn't wait. And also, um, uh, would I have any genetic abnormalities? And basically, the way they do that is uh, by about six to eight weeks, um, the fetal DNA is already circulating in, in the mother. And you can isolate the mother's blood and, in fact, sequence it and find out the fetal DNA so you can make an interpretation. So I knew very quickly that we were going to have um, Jake, our first boy. And uh, that was about 2013. And at that time, we had to pay for this technology um, uh, out of pocket. And it was, I think, about uh, $1,500 uh, for the test. And a couple of years later, uh, we had our second child. Um, this is John. And again, we applied the same test again. And by then, the cost of the sequencing uh, had come down quite a bit. By then, uh, we pay about, I think, five to $700. I don't know what it's like, because John is now two years old. So uh, what I'm trying to say here is that um, the technology is getting better, it's getting cheaper, but um, the transplant community has kind of uh, taken this test and apply it to organ transplant. If we substitute um, fetus as an organ, basic, basically you have the same idea. You can find out DNA from the donor that's circulating in the recipient and try to quantitate um, how much DNA there is. And if that uh, threshold of the um, donor DNA rises above some uh, predefined threshold, in this case, 1% that I have defined, then that would indicate allograft injury and the donor DNA is released into the recipient circulation. And so this is a very interesting way where we can non-invasively follow the patient and what the um, authors have shown is that um, it's more sensitive than, than um, serum creatinine in terms of picking up rejection. And then the company flipped it around and then said, well, what about, can we follow tumor DNA as well? And uh, actually they can, because it's essentially the same concept is that in the, tu in the oncology world, they can apply this assay to understand for those on chemotherapy or anti-tumor treatment, what happens to the burden of tumor DNA? It may go down, it may rise again, they get treated and then goes down. So it becomes a very useful test. They don't have to keep re-biopsying the patient to understand what the tumor is doing. So we are now beginning to take the first step towards precision medicine. If we take these overlapping technologies all together, um, at the outset, we can begin to define based on applet analysis, perhaps what is the likelihood of rejection in our patients if they go on CPI. There's parallel clinical studies that will begin to define what is the optimal immune suppression medication to use uh, in our patients when they go on CPI. And I don't think there's a perfect regimen because everyone's uh, risk of rejection from a starting point is already different. So I don't believe that there's a single um, regimen that's gonna be the best for the patients. It has to be individualized. And that's where monitoring comes in is that we can begin to monitor patients with serial um, donor-derived cell-free DNA for graph health and also tumor DNA to understand is the CPI efficacious or not. And based on those results, perhaps we can begin to tailor the CPI regimen as well as what we administer for uh, immune suppression as maintenance. And this is really the study that, that we propose to do. 
Um, this is a study um, that's done in collaboration with University of Washington. Dr. Chris Blosser is the PI. Uh, I'm the co-PI in this study. And what we hope to do is to have a single arm study. We want to enroll 10 patients, all kidney transplant patients who have um, tumor that requires the use of CPI. And at the time of the diagnosis, we basically would consent a patient. We collect all their demographic information. We will perform donor recipient effort mismatch and capture that data. And then thereafter, we, every two weeks, uh, we begin to monitor them for their cell-free DNA and um, circulating tumor DNA. And we, uh, we bank that data. And at the end of the 12 months, we again want to capture the clinical data and also to understand um, uh, just how they did and then we'll core data through the data that we have on their um, DNA uh, to understand, are we able to predict any of the adverse uh, uh, events that have happened? Um, this study is not uh, up and running yet. It's very close. Um, we're just waiting for a few sign off. It is supported by Notera Inc., which is a company that makes the um, cell-free DNA and also the tumor the right DNA test. So, that really concludes my presentation. Um, and I, I want to acknowledge that the patient and his family, they have been very patient with us. Uh, we were very upfront with them from the beginning that, you know, this is a work in progress. I don't have all the information, no one does, but we present a rational way to begin. And we promise to follow them closely and, and be there with them as a whole team. I want to thank Dr. Michelle and, and her team for really um, uh, doing an uh, outstanding job following the patient and also uh, talking to us when they need to. The patient's oncologist for even bringing this up, and I feel that a lot of oncologists, they sometimes look at these referrals, so I'll write say that this is a transplant patient. Nope, you don't get to use CPI. And I, I do think that's the wrong approach. I think that we need, we need to find a way for to use CPI in these patients because this is really a game changer medication that I, I feel that should not be uh, withheld from uh, transplant recipients. And again, we, we our entire uh, kidney transplant team at EGH, follow this patient closely, including our pharmacists and also my other colleagues when I'm absent. And also uh, I want to thank UW, um, John Gill and Sanjay Rao, who's an oncologist, and Otera for um, getting this study up and running. Um, and hopefully we start to recruit the first few patients in the next few months. Thank you very much. I'll take questions now. Thanks, James, for um, really um, incredibly patient-centered focus, but with uh, fantastic new technology and understanding of uh, processes and, and medications. Very um, I'm just going to look in the Q&A or the chat box. Um, okay, here we go. So what prednisone dose was the patient on and should we even increase that dose before the CPL initiation? Yeah, so the prednisone uh, patient was on five milligrams of prednisone. Um, I'm not sure going from five to 10 milligrams or higher would necessarily uh, mitigate many of the side effects um, or the risk of rejection. Now, I did ask the patient if he had adverse events to prednisone before, if he could tolerate more, and he had no issues. He was also a big guy as well. So I did increase the prednisone to 10 milligrams before starting CPI. Um, I'm not sure um, that adjustment would really make a huge difference though. I think uh, that's when we need more patient data to tell us. So there's no real need to, in, to sort of systematically increase the prednisone. No, that was no. The context yeah. of the question. Okay, I'm just going to look at um, unmute themselves. I believe they want to ask. So I guess I mean you started out by saying that there's no increase in risk of um, malignancies in over the last years, as documented in that um, KI, which. I think is good, um, right? Um, and is that because over time we have been looking for lowest doses and being much more sophisticated in our transplant select? Um, is it because we have better surveillance of this group of patients because they're under medical care? Like there are a number of thoughts that come to mind as to why we're not seeing any change, right? Yeah, I think it could be argued both ways. One is, well, maybe we should be seeing a decrease because surveillance got better, um, our anti-tumor treatment got better, uh, but perhaps that's been offset by the fact, as you have alluded to, we're transplanting older patients. Patients are surviving longer with a kidney transplant and they're 
overall exposure to um, the burden of immune suppression is now longer as well. Uh, so I think probably because of the two uh, balancing each other out that overall the incidence hasn't changed that much. Uh, I should say that that data is pre-CPI um, um, uh, introduction. So I do think if we were to analyze this again in 10 years, we're going to see a different pattern. Great. Two other questions. Um, what level of sirolimus is adequate for these patients if you are going to switch them? And just in the years of time after getting rejection and prednisone therapy is given, is there any merit in switching CPI therapy? So um, these are loaded questions. Um, the target I aimed for was around uh, four to six. Um, I find that if one goes higher, uh, sometimes patients may not be able to tolerate it that well. And also there's no clear evidence that going higher would mitigate the risk of rejection. That was done in a different paper, although in a small number of patients. The second question is in regards to uh, what happens to the CPI in this particular patient. That's a question really for the oncologist. Uh, when I last communicated with the oncologist, she said that she was very actually happy with how patient responded to the entry tumor uh, effect. She's performing a PET scan for the patient to understand how much residual tumor burden that there is. But if there has been a substantial decrease, she was happy to hold the CPI for now to wait for the graph to stabilize and then uh, contemplate the next step. Um, I don't think she's worked that part out yet. In terms of what I intend to do, I'm going to do a very slow taper on the prednisone, as I already said, and depends on whether the patient goes back on CPI or not. Because if the patient goes back on CPI, what we already know in this patient is that the regimen that I selected, prednisone plus aromas, is insufficient to keep uh, the patient from getting rejection. So probably I'll need to add another agent back in, and maybe that could be in the form of a low-dose mycophenolate. If the patient doesn't go back on the CPI, then I would probably just wait it out and see where does the creatinine level up and what does the um, uh, renal function look like on the two agents alone before re adding another agent, which could, again, increase the risk of the, the tumor burden again. Thanks. Well, um, that's all the questions. And I think, um, you know, at a peak, we had over 45 people on the you reached and educated a substantial number of people across the province and I thank everybody for their attention and for your preparation and thoughtfulness and, uh, and wish the patient luck as well as uh, thank you for your thoughtful overview of an uh, exciting new way of uh, approaching um, this particular problem. So thanks very much James and thanks to all of you for participating and everybody gets seven minutes back in their day. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you.